Okay, so now we come to the uh, concluding section of this conference, which is uh, sort of pretentiously called the cultural panel, but really it is uh, more meant to open the floor for more discussion, and I ask these four people here to uh, come to, you know, make a short statement on what we want Europe to be in the future, because I'm a, um, a stubborn cultural optimist, despite all of the <laughs> terrible things we discussed uh, yesterday and today, simply because I believe that the human beings are po potentially all creative, um, that the emergence of genius has been so rare in the past because the material burden um, did not allow people to develop their creative potential and therefore you think that genius is an exception. But I, I fundamentally think that that is the natural condition of man. And Nicolaus of Cusa, who I quote a lot because he really is a fountain of knowledge, and I can, those of you who have not looked at his work, encourage to do so because, you know, when he said, when he had written the Doctor Ignorantia, he prefaced it with the remarks that he was saying that he was totally aware that he was saying something completely new, which never had been thought by any other human being on the planet, and that these thoughts would create a new era for mankind. Now, it was absolutely true, but how could he know that? How could he forecast the future in such a bold fashion? Well, because he knew that by rejecting the wrong thinking of peripatetics and scholasticism, that he was reviving the ideas of Plato on a higher level. As a matter of fact, if you look at the short defense of, of uh, Dr. Ignorantia, after he, attacked, he saw that Josef Wenck had attacked that writing and said that this was a, a pan, pantheist uh, kind of uh, heresy, he described the people who have found the truth, like people standing on a, on a high tower, looking down on the Aristotelians who are chasing things, running back and forth. You know, and he said that the person who has elevated himself to the level of uh, platonic thinking is like the one who sees the chased, the chaser, and the process of chasing. With other words, he is self-conscious about the dynamic as a whole, while the poor Aristotelian who is caught by that something is either A or B, uh, he will be caught in these contradictions and not understand anything. And we have to get this paradigm shift discussion seriously because the, what, what Plato called the uh, hypothesis of the uh, higher hypothesis, or what Nicolaus of Cusa called the coincidentia oppositorum, is simply a totally different way of thinking and you know people have to make that leap in thinking because my husband who is uh, you know probably the best uh, forecaster proven presently living on the planet he keeps for months now saying that we have to get people away from the level of sense certainty uh, because it makes people stupid and the oligarchy reduces consciously people to the level of pleasure and uh, maximal pleasure in the present, avoiding pain, uh, you know, making them more banal by all these stupid entertainment policies by causing them to be more brutal, more perverse, more pornographic. Uh, and that is something we have to consciously reject because Europe right now is not only economically in a terrible condition, but Europe is really totally away from where Europe should be. And this European Union I'm rejecting, among other, that probably the most important reason is because they have nothing to do with the high periods of Europe. They are not promoting the Greek uh, ancient uh, 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 <clears throat> classical period to be revived. They are not talking to the Span Spanish people from the standpoint of the Andalusian uh, Renaissance or the Goya paintings or Raimundus Lulus or all the other many beautiful 
con contributions Spain has made, they're not trying to revive the uh, Italy of the Italian Renaissance, leave alone the Germany of, uh, you know, I agree with uh, <coughs> Professor Tahan from yesterday that Germany should be proud. However, there is a big difference between our classical tradition and the present crop of mediocre and even more stupid politicians who do not have any share in, in this tradition. So what we have to do in the future of Europe, and that is something which should emanate from this conference, is we have to not only go in you know, an offensive, try to stop World War III, have these alternatives in showing people there is a way to have development instead of war, that the new name for peace is development. Uh, not only do we solve the problem of the euro and you know, have both the expertise of Professor Hankel, who after all was uh, the head of the m m money division of the German ministry, he was the chief economist of um, uh, the Kreditanstalt für Wiederaufbau, and he comes from a period where there was still a thinking in terms of real economy. But we have to add to that urgently the accomplishments uh, of my husband, which is, after all, and I'm you know, modest enough to say that he's the leading economist of the world today because he has developed this physical economy further than anybody else. And we, when he says that the only solution is to get people away from uh, the reliance on sense certainty and that we have to get... Uh, people uplifted to think in terms of creativity and not just on Sunday, but the whole week. Um, you know, I mean, it has to become a style of life to approach any problem from the standpoint of a creative solution, thinking in terms of metaphor, thinking in terms of flank, thinking in terms of out of the box, don't be reduced to such, uh, you know, a, a two-dimensional person, but develop your creative potential, and we have to induce that in the population that they start to love the uh, sweetness of truth more than the sweetness of some praline. Uh, so, uh, you know, in a certain sense, we have to do the same thing what Friedrich Schiller did with his great classical dramas, you know, where a normal citizen goes into uh, the theater and is all of a sudden confronted with the large issues of civilization, where he has to identify with the actor on the stage who has to decide, you know, to do good for coming generations and to think like, you know, a head of state, to think like uh, a king, you know, I mean, Schiller uses some of these historical dramas, I'm not advertising monarchy here, uh, and uplift people to think really big to think in terms of mankind, to think about your personal responsibility for what comes out of this historical epoch. And that's what we have to inject. Uh, and then I think Europe will be totally possible to revive. I think if we add to these economic development plans the need to have a moral renaissance, to go back to classical culture, and to go back to an idea that art has to be beautiful, which already you know, eliminates all kinds of categories of what is past as art today because uh, Schiller in his uh, letter exchange with uh, Körner made a very convincing argument that a poem which is not beautiful is a bad poem. Uh, and therefore I think we need to introduce beauty in the discussion and to revive, you know, classical music not because of, you know, that it's a question of taste but simply because classical music is the only music which corresponds to the creative faculty of the mind, while all other forms of music, especially these noises uh, in certain rhythms, are destructive of the cognitive process. So we have to get a discussion, and I know it's more difficult to make, people, to make stupid people creative than to turn people into morons, but still, it's the only way to go. And that is what I'm fighting for in Europe, and now I want the word to go to Liliane. <laughs> Mattia Hastu, dust? Okay. okay, my name is Liliana Gorini. 
I'm chair, for the few of you who do not know me, some are new, I'm chairwoman of Movisol, the Rushi's movement in Italy, and I had the honor in the last 40 years to cooperate with Mr. LaRouche and Mrs. LaRouche on some of our main campaigns for cultural, for a cultural renaissance, starting with the campaign to revive the Verdi tuning, which got the support of 2,000 opera singers all over the world in 1988, and uh, more recently, uh, the Don Giovanni project in, uh, in Virginia, in which our youth singers of the Lim uh, performed the whole opera, Don Giovanni of Mozart. But uh, um, before I uh, go into the positive side of what to do to have a Europe which is culturally at the level of the Renaissance and the German classics, and the, and the Spanish classics and the Arab classics, I would contrast this with something which may shock you, because last night we had uh, the high point of culture with Beethoven and Verdi. Now you, you can get a taste, brief taste, of the lowest point of today's culture. Uh, first show it and then I'll say what it is. Some may know it. Open Gangnam Style Gangnam Style I don't know how many know this This is one of the first hits on the MTV And uh, what shocked me uh, You know it Okay, I'm sure you do And uh, uh, <laughs> And uh, uh, I, uh, what shocked me is a few weeks ago, since I do follow uh, Daniel Estulin's uh, uh, advice and I use Facebook in Italy, we are a very small organization, so we have to use all means to become known. And I, I do uh, post uh, our statements and LaRouche's statements on Facebook. And on Facebook I found, even on Facebook, some people who were saying, uh, this piece has, been, uh, has become the, the center of a meeting of 12,000 young people in Spain, all meeting together in some gigantic stadium to dance this uh, disgusting dance, which is like riding a horse and whipping. And uh, 12,000 people all together dancing this stuff. So uh, when Helga asked yesterday in the morning, why aren't young people in the streets to fight uh, against war and for the construction of the Middle East, that may answer the question. That's where they were, instead of being on the streets to fight for the, our program for the Middle East development. So uh, this... Uh, challenges us, because that's what we will face when we go in the streets and meet young people. Many of them have this or the disco uh, in mind or go, going, becoming drunk already with 15. This is part of the plan of the oligarchy to destroy the population. We, we said the, the people are the enemy and the culture is used to kill the population mentally first and then also physically because I don't know about the other countries, but in Italy there are many car accidents which end with uh, uh, dead young people at the end of the disco on Saturday night. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the um, principles which uh, I think were made clear by LaRouche in this project we had in Virginia with the Don Giovanni uh, one year ago, is what I call the Don Giovanni principle in politics. These people, these politicians, Frau Merkel, Monti, uh, Samaras, all of them pretty much, including Holland, they believe they can cheat their voters, they believe they can defy natural law, they believe they are arrogant enough to believe that they can continue to keep the power even if the population is suffering and dying of hunger and uh, having no uh, health uh, sanitation. Now, the Don Giovanni principle was shown in a number of cases. For example, when Berlusconi was dumped, he was one of such guys who believed he could have fun with uh, minor girls and yet be, stay the most popular politician on earth. He was destroyed by the elections. Uh, well, the, uh, Dominique Strauss-Kahn is another example of that, but it's not only men. It's not only a question of raping 
Women, it's a question of raping nations. So even women can do that. Merkel does it. Susan Rice does it. Obama does it. Even if he doesn't have a sex scandal, he's still a Don Giovanni in this sense that he thinks he can define natural law and yet he, he can win as he won the elections again. He thinks it doesn't matter. The American population is suffering, but yet he will nevertheless go ahead and win because he's, uh, he's Nero, because he's uh, a egomaniac, and people will nevertheless like him. They don't have any compassion for the population, as uh, Obama has shown, for example, in the first debate with Romney. But uh, what does uh, Don Giovanni teach us? The commendatore, which identifies and symbolizes the natural law, finally actually uh, punishes Don Giovanni when he invites him for dinner, and in that he, 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 he brings him to hell. And Don Giovanni accepts the invitation precisely because he thinks he will defy natural law also there. He will finally win. As they uh, performed in La Scala last year, the Don Giovanni, they had him win. This indicates that the oligarchy knows very well what is the Don Giovanni principle in politics. And uh, what, when I, uh, Elga asked me to imagine how will uh, the culture in Europe look in 10 years, well, if we win, it will look like uh, new Dantes writing uh, Dantes Comedia, and they have a lot of material, like uh, Count Ugolino, who eats up uh, the head of his son, and uh, Edopo il pasto aveva più fan che pria, after eating is more hungry than before. This is the oligarchy. These are the, the merchant bankers. It's exactly the same image. They have, uh, for example, Benigni, who is a, a famous actor and an Oscar winner in Italy. He reads Dante's Commedia in the squares in Florence because the Monti government decided to cancel the chair of Dante's studies in the University of Florence. So they have to do it in the squares, on the streets. And he said Monti would be a perfect candidate to be in the circle of the technocrats in Dante's Commedia. So I, I think Italians, instead of dancing uh, uh, Cagnam style, they should write a new Commedia about these disgusting politicians we have had in the last 30 years, starting with Monti, Draghi, and the present government. Uh, and, uh, uh, of course, I see in 10 years young people gathering in stadiums instead of uh, dancing Cagnam style to perform the Ode to Joy of Beethoven. That's my idea in 10 years if we win. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I am uh, Odile Mojon from uh, Paris, uh, Solidarité et Progrès. So, uh, just to uh, go also in the same direction as uh, Liliana, I just want to just um, uh, paint a short landscape because what we, what we see with uh, culture is something which is very obvious on many aspects and very insidious and on uh, many other. And it's really through uh, the culture and the environment that it uh, creates that we can uh, bring people to this uh, voluntary servitude that Jacques mentioned uh, this morning uh, by making people totally complicit of their own uh, uh, servitude uh, as, being, as becoming a slave of their own uh, destruction. And just... Uh, uh, I see two main points which, which are really very important. Uh, how the uh, universal ideas are being destroyed. And it is being destroyed very clearly because uh, you have the introduction of the relativism. It's very clear. I can give you an example in France. Uh, as they built, uh, well, 20 years ago now, a very big... Um, uh, building in Paris, which is called Cité de la Musique. It was done by Boulez with a horrible character. And it's supposed to be now where you have the highest school of music in France. And here now it's dedicated not to music, singular, 
but it's dedicated to musics, plural. So you have all types of musics which are being placed on the same level, uh, including classical music, and hence every music are, uh, you know, there is no specificity any longer. So that's one point, uh, uh, how they uh, operated the, uh, the destruction of any uh, principle. Plus, the other thing uh, also, uh, which goes together, is how uh, has been promoted mainly a sensual effect music. I'm speaking just for music now, but it applies to many uh, other fields. And for example, you would hardly go in any place in France, uh, I, I'm thinking in particular Paris, uh, any concert that you have, you will have, let's say, one classical author, Beethoven, but you have, uh, for all of them, you will have, let's say, for example, uh, Prokofiev, uh, Schoenberg, uh, anything you want. So what is destroyed here also is uh, a kind of a unity uh, in the classical uh, principle of art. And it's, uh, for people, it's re it, it really has an effect because they cannot understand any longer what it means, uh, classical music. Plus, another effect also, which I want to mention, is uh, the question of the language. Uh, I've been trying once in a while to look uh, on the uh, Internet for modern poetry. And I've come to conclusion that there is nothing as modern poetry. There, it is certainly one of the art which has been totally destroyed. Uh, I've seen things which are being called poetry, and it's, it is just an accumulation of words without any meaning, uh, no ideas whatsoever, uh, nothing. And it's very important, too, because uh, poetry is the language, and the language is the capacity to express ideas. And uh, if you think now in the crisis where we, ha we, we are now, uh, we meet very often people who, are, who have very interesting ideas, uh, but you can uh, re realize uh, uh, very quickly that it's very difficult for them to express those ideas. And if you go, for example, in suburbs, it's even worse, because here you have people who have been dispossessed of anything, they, have, they are being excluded of any productive uh, activities, no job, no future whatsoever, and of course, uh, no culture besides uh, what uh, Liniana has been showing, or sport, or whatever. And of course, those people, they just can't express uh, ideas. They, often enough, they even cannot conceptualize ideas. So uh, they are deprived, uh, even up to the point of, of being uh, able to have a thinking uh, process. And I think now, to come to how we can have something in um, 10 years, uh, uh, what it will need, uh, uh, it's, it will be mainly uh, what has been discussed yesterday with uh, the great project, because once you have uh, uh, the responsibility of going into space, of course you need uh, uh, another culture. Of course you need to be able to, to think, to formulate ideas. And once you uh, are discover a new frontier, well, once you discover a new world that we don't know nothing about it, you will have, you will, it's not that you will uh, have to express something, you will, it will uh, come as a necessity uh, to, to express something new and to bring it to your uh, fellow citizen to be able to have something, a tool, uh, whatever this tool will be, I don't know, but it will be something on the level of art. It might be poetry, it might be music, I don't know. But you will have to, to find something, a new way to express uh, this and to express this beauty. And where are you going to, uh, to, to find that? You are going to find that by going back to classical, to find something which is, uh, which is uh, uh, the nearest uh, in the spirit, uh, and you will use that as a means to uh, elaborate, to go further, but uh, keeping in, with the same quality of, uh, of language, uh, and you will use that as a stepping stone to have a new uh, quality of music, a new quality of poetry, of uh, theater, uh, 
in any other field of art. Uh, one last thing also which I think is very important uh, is how uh, we will have also to uh, uh, build new and beautiful cities because you, it's very uh, difficult uh, to have uh, people be able to consider uh, to have this, uh, bring this new quality of art uh, if they are living in a very ugly cities as it is now uh, being the case for most of people. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Kasia Kuczkowski and I'm a, a political organizer for the Bürgerrechtsbewegung Solidarität uh, in Essen. Um, well, Europe in 10 years, um, <laughs> I think Europe will have uh, true leaders. And um, in 10 years, um, you can also say that in German. Um, and we are um, in, a, in a time right now where this is a big problem to imagine. I mean, all these presentations we have seen uh, throughout uh, these uh, last two days, um, all these you know, fruits we are planting for the future, um, a lot of people have problems to communicate that, and that is where we have to start with, especially with the youth in Europe, because the picture um, of the situation, especially for the uh, young generations, um, is outstanding. I mean, we have un uh, raising unemployment in several regions, uh, for instance, in Spain, you have an official unemployment of 78%. Um, and there's, I mean, the rate of uh, suicide um, and all these things we hear now more and more uh, is a sign that we have to change something fundamentally in the thinking and in the approach of the policies. And it has to start with uh, the imagination for the future. Um, Mrs. LaRouche was repeatedly um, challenging us, uh, especially the younger uh, organizers in this movement, um, to, make, to paint a very clear image of how we are, are imagine the future, how, how we um, would like the world to look like. I know that a lot of people, or most people, um, interrupt their thought, this thought process within five seconds. And I think some of you know what is, uh, in, what, um, yeah, thoughts are intervening. It's like, oh no, this is just daydreaming, or that's not gonna happen. That is too nice to be true or to be, become true. And that is where we have to start with if we wanna really, um, have accomplished all these projects. Um, and it was, I just want to remind you, it was a very long dream of the slaves to become free and to become citizens with all human rights um, acknowledged. And most of them could not even imagine that. They could not even think about it. But it was very few who accomplished it. And it was a very, very big dream by many people to be able to fly. Most people do, could not even imagine that. They had no idea about it. But it was very few who made it happen. And it was also a very, very great dream by a lot of people to put a, a footstep on another planet. And like you know, there is still today a lot of people who cannot even imagine that um, and just deny the fact that it happened. <laughs> um, and again, it was very, very few people who fought it through. And I want to ask you, is it a dream to live in, to have an Im image of a world where all parts of it, all nations, are working together for the common aims of mankind? And everyone who tried to organize um, other people know that today it is also very difficult for most people to even imagine that. Um, and that is our challenge. And um, I mean, it's also very few 
who will realize it. And these leaders of Europe will be inspired by what is uh, happening in, at this conference, by these ideas, by these projects, which are so far just thought objects. But it is up to us to realize that and to um, yeah, make it happen. And I know that a lot of people we are talking to are saying, yes, I absolutely agree, there must be a profound change. But it has to happen from the youth, the youth generation. And like it was said before, um, they are not on the streets because of several reasons. And I agree, I mean, the youth are one of the most hit by the crisis. But it's not just the youth, because what the youth need is inspiration. They need an idea about what human society is all about. And uh, to human society, every individual is part of. So we should really um, get this, these ideas um, we were discussing during these two days and get so many people as possible inspired and to become not just people who dream about a better future, but are actively part of doing it. All right. Thanks. <laughs> So <clears throat> my name is uh, Stefan Tolksdorf, and as Kascha, I am a political organizer in Germany's capital, uh, in Berlin. Now, <clears throat> since <clears throat> we're running short with time, and I would actually like to have discussion, I'm just going to say a very short thing, um, because I do think a lot about this question of um, getting the young generation uh, and youth today into this, uh, into this fight, and Everybody who is an organizer knows how difficult it is. Um, we've discussed at, at some length uh, about the problems, and uh, I think one meaningful step into uh, figuring out that there is something very universal about the way the human mind works is jokes. So I'm actually just going to tell a short joke uh, just to give you a little taste. Uh, it's <clears throat> and I hope you will forgive me, even though this is a kind of a breach of protocol. Um, this joke is about a Polish Jew uh, who traveled together with his wife to, to Paris in, uh, in the 19th century. Um, <clears throat> so they visit the city, they, have, uh, they do uh, tours to the most important places that you have to see, uh, the Louvre and other museums and so forth. And then uh, one evening they have an appointment at, um, at, a, very, uh, at a very famous club called uh, Moulin Rouge. So they're in the hotel, the husband is already dressed and he's waiting in the lobby uh, for his wife to finish makeup and everything else. Uh, and as he's sitting there waiting, this very elegant and beautiful young lady comes almost flying down the stairs. And uh, she floats past him and she recognizes that he's looking at her. <clears throat> and so she whispers into his ear, 1,000 francs. So the poor man uh, thinks for a split second and whispers after her, 500! <laughs> she, she leaves, she floats out the door. His wife comes uh, <clears throat> and uh, they take the carriage to Moulin Rouge where they're having a dinner table reserved and uh, enjoying some sort of funny entertainment there. And the place next to the dear husband is empty and this young woman comes into the door, uh, into the club, sits down on, his, on the chair on his left. She looks over at his wife, and then she whispers into his ear, See, that's what you see for your, what you get for your 500. <laughs> <laughs> now, as I said, you will have to forgive me, but um, I used it... I used it um, I used jokes many times in organizing, because, uh, you know... There are bad jokes like this one. There are much better ones that take a bit more effort and time. But uh, jokes have something very universal. They provoke laughter. And if you think about it, uh, you can make some sort of a forecast. You're doing something that 
you can you have already you already have an idea of how the mind of your interlocutor, uh, the person you talk to, is going to react. And it's not something that's necessarily up to their will. I mean, they may be completely blocked, and they're not going to laugh, uh, and that's almost embarrassing. But it, that happens too. Um, now, Beethoven and Schiller, on a much much higher level than a simple joke, uh, have such a an effect on the human mind. And I can assure you that what you've seen last night is really only a little tiny uh, bit of it. You haven't seen anything yet with only that, that, even though it was beautiful. But there's so much more in this world uh, that needs to be discovered and, uh, and brought to people. Now, this conference, I think, is very special because unlike other conferences that we have had in the past, um, it reminds me a lot of what I heard many years ago from Dr. Martin Luther King, that only when it is dark enough can you see the stars. And I think the crisis has, has gotten so bad and so obvious uh, that uh, people are looking for answers. And that has shaped, for me very consciously, the kind of discussion that we're having here, a very conscious discussion that we cannot fool around uh, with our lives, uh, not in this time, um, in this world. <clears throat> and... My, you know, I have a little bit of a difficulty forecasting what Europe might look like in 10 years or in 20 or in 50 years, but I do not accept that these idiot, idiotic bureaucrats in Brussels occupy the name Europe for their construct uh, that is inhuman and brutal and kills people. That, I simply don't accept that. That is, um, yeah, it's, it's not acceptable. So for us, I think one step you could take, and I'm always happy to talk about him, is to get to know uh, Frederick Douglass. Because Frederick Douglass, as an American slave, did, I think, two things that are very similar to those challenges that we often face. One is, on a personal level, escaping slavery, not accepting your own slavery and, getting, and try, finding an escape. But then later, uh, for him it was not much later, uh, to discover the responsibility that comes with that act, which is how do you get the other slaves out of slavery? Now, obviously, today's slavery system is much more hideous and insidious because it, it induces young people to believe um, that it's not slavery at all. It's fun. And you think about it, fun in that kind of uh, definition that we have today is always easy. It's always easy. You know, you... I don't know, you watch a movie, you take drugs, um, you go partying. You know, it's not nothing that ever really involves any effort you know, uh, on, on, the, on, on the part of whoever wants that kind of fun. So we can all already be suspicious of that. If it's too easy, it can't be that much fun. And with Douglas, you realize it's not, it's not the easy things. It's, it, is, it really is the hard things. The, the, the fact, for instance, that he... Uh, as someone who would have every right in the world to despise the kind of system that he grew up in, that didn't even give him his last name, that denied him his, uh, his, his family, he never knew his mother or his father, um, that basically treated him as an animal, he still undertook the intellectual effort to discover that the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States are instruments of freedom that have been created uh, with ideas uh, that have been fought for uh, in, in many, many centuries. And after all, it was Frederick Douglass, if I remember correctly, who gave Schiller the name the Poet of Freedom. And he read him in German. <laughs> so there's a challenge for you. Um, yeah, I think we should just discuss it, but we, we should do it fr from a standpoint that organizing, which is a very difficult thing at times, it can be very frustrating also when you're doing what we do, organizing at book tables, trying to, you know, introduce people to the ideas we have, trying to get them close, uh, even trying to sometimes get people to stop to even have a conversation is almost, you know, it's, it's a t quite a piece of work. But on the other hand, that's the only uh, source of actual fun because you're doing something, well, that contributes to something much, much bigger than your own life or the person you're talking to. And um, I think that's the, the only things that, that really, really count. Those things that you can be sure will be important um, long after you have lived your life. It's a source of happiness.